requested that no bio be offered before this presentation. Uh, not because credentials aren't important, you're welcome to read my bio on the SATS website if you choose to, but it's because conviction and calling are a big part of the conversation that is continuing today. So today I've had the opportunity to be a spokesperson for a profound conversation between God and SATS as it unfolds in the field of Christian counselling. So over the past month, we've engaged various voices, every time starting with the caveat that the opinions presented may not be SATS views. This is a conversation that we've had for the past three weeks. We have been in a process of inquiry and exploration. So today, as the program coordinator for counseling at SATS, I would like to share with you what is Christian counseling from SATS's perspective as we continue the conversation with the triune God. So for those familiar with SATS, you will also be familiar with the following. Our mission is to provide biblical Christocentric distance education and training to Christians and leaders in particular within their local church environment to equip them to be Holy Spirit empowered members of God's household. Our statement of faith, we define ourselves as a Bible based Christ centered spirit led seminary. We are a home to a broad cross section of Christians who believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of the triune God, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. So it is thus not a surprise to hear from the counseling training team. Our mission is to provide biblical Christocentric distance education and training to those called to Christian counseling within their local church environment to equip them to be Holy Spirit empowered counselors of ethical excellence. So if it's okay with you today, perhaps I can invite us to a summary statement from which to work today. Let's look at to equip Christians for Christian counseling ministry, Bible-based, Christ-centered and Spirit-led. So this will be our framework for the conversation as we move through some important ideas, theology and ministry praxis. Equip, Christians, Christian counseling and ministry. Now we will go through this perhaps not in that order, but I will periodically let you know where we are and where we're going. So yes, the squares over the words are exactly where they need to be and they're just there to help you see exactly which word we're working on at which time. Okay, so this is where we would like to start today with the word Christian or Christians. So who are we as Christians? Made in God's image, fallen, redeemed by the blood of Christ, restored to God's family. Professor Godfrey Harold suggests that often in evangelicalism, we overshadow our value in God, Imago Dei, by our focus on our identity in Christ, Imago Christi. Rather than yes, but, perhaps we might consider the yes and. Yes, humanity's value started at creation and we chose to live independently from God's plan. Sin, separation and death enters the world. You can read about that, the first half of Romans 6. Yes, our value at creation is distorted, corrupted. We need a savior. And Jesus, God's son, both fully man and fully God, chose to die for all of humanity, redeeming all those who accept his sacrifice. And that they have life in his name for all eternity. Yes, a person's value is started at creation and it is given redemptive clarity by being brought under the cross. That you can read in Mason. Harold argues that humanity's value in God calls us to witness human dignity, respecting value at creation. Respecting a person's value at creation does not ignore their fallen sinful state of desperation that needs a savior. Rather, it invites a position, a stance, into which we might, as Christians, engage one another. We are Christian because God first loved us, 1 John 4, chose to die for his creation, Ephesians 5, and in accepting this, accepting an invitation to live abundantly by his spirit in a transformational journey towards Christ-likeness. This includes suffering, obedience, sacrifice, self-transcendence. 
We are called to love one another as we love ourselves. Matthew 22. Live by Christ's example of self-sacrifice and engage meaningfully in works created before the foundation of the world for each one individually. So it is Christ that loves the church. It is Christ that gave himself up for her. It is Christ that makes her holy. It is Christ that cleanses and washes her with water. Through the word, it is Christ who presents himself to himself, the church, radiant without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. So what is our ministry then? So if you remember where we're at, let's look at where we're going. Let's look at ministry. Ministry, call to care and call to counseling. So Thurston in 2020 reminds us that every Christian, no matter who they are or what they do, are called to minister to others and make disciples. We are called to care, to feel for the brokenness of this world, to evangelize. Why? It's not for numbers in pews. It's because we genuinely care about the brokenness of the world. And we have an answer regarding wholeness. Galatians 6, Ephesians 4. All are called to care, but not all are called to Christian counseling. A call to counseling. So there are various ways that God works with his people, as you know. And this journey to knowing the calling of the Lord on your life individually is personal. Thurston offers five ways of knowing. The Damascus Road calling of Acts 9, which he calls instant calling or instant knowing. The progressive calling, which is like a sequence of events in your life in which you notice God's movement. And just to elaborate on this, Irwin considers the five CSs of godly decision making in this space. And I'm just going to quickly list them off to you. If you want to know more about these, you can take my email and I will share more about them. But the five CSs of godly decision making in the space of understanding God's movement in your life is counsel of the saints, CS. Commanding scripture, common sense, compelling spirit, and coincidental signs. It's important to remember those. Let's go back to Thurston's information. So Thurston continues and shares that it could be a calling from birth or the set apart by the church calling or the open door call. It may be that you are called to full-time ministry or part-time ministry. You may be called to be a psychologist or a Christian counselor, or perhaps even a life coach. This is a personal journey that perhaps SATS might should offer a course on one day to assist you in that space. But if nothing else, please know that the calling to counseling is not the same as the calling to care that we are all called to do. So call to the ministry of Christian counseling. Let's go back and just see where we're at. So this is where we're at. And let me show you where we're going now. What is Christian counseling? So if you Google, what is Christian counseling? The definitions are endless. The opportunities are quite diverse and there may be a need to run, run away. So where do you start to understand your calling? Well, the Bible, Jesus Christ, grace and truth. So calling is all about change. You can read about that in Collins 2007. Everything is changing second by second. Some people become overwhelmed by the changes around them, their own changes or inability to change or the pace or rhythm of change in their lives. Well, counseling is also about change. Christian counseling is coming alongside a person or people and journeying with them for a season from one space to another, such that lasting change draws them closer to Christ likeness. This journey is Bible based, Christ centered and spirit led, and it needs to be psychologically sound. Van der Spee mentions that. It is one of the helping ministries in the church, such as worship, evangelicalism, teaching. Collins ventures to suggest that is probably one of the spiritual gifts given for building up the church and strengthening individual believers. Gifts, remember, are more than natural abilities. They are something extra 
given to believers by the Holy Spirit, is what Collins claims on page 71. So Christian counselors seek to assist people with personality growth and development. Collins shares, counseling is about assisting individuals, family members, and married couples to resolve interpersonal tensions or relate effectively to one another. And counseling can help those whose life patterns are self-defeating and cause unhappiness. The Christian counselor seeks to bring people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to help them find forgiveness and relief from the crippling effects of sin and guilt. Ultimately, the Christian caregiver hopes to be able to help others become disciples of Christ and disciplers of others. If our Christian counseling is to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, spirit-led, and psychologically sound, such that it is ethically and legally helpful, not harmful, it ought to consider the biopsychosocial spiritual etiology of problems and integration of psychology into our theological worldview. This is where we engage the idea of model of praxis. So the past four weeks, we've explored three different models of praxis. This is not one's theology, nor is it one's identity. It is a movement between theory and practice. It invites critical reflection, expert voices, again reflection, and again change. It is a dynamic transformational engagement between theory and practice, in which the Christian counselor seeks knowledge and truth with wisdom and discernment as he or she grows in Christian counseling praxis. We stand on the shoulders of the giants who have journeyed before us with wisdom and discernment, scriptural integrity, psychological soundness, and intimate spirit leading in order to practice in grace and truth. Herein lies the responsibility that comes with the invitation or calling. So let's talk a little bit about models of praxis. Why the need for a model of praxis? Every counselor and client comes with a unique set of experiences, worldviews, theological perspectives, and cultural expectations. Jesus approached people in different ways, depending on the place where they met, their backgrounds, and their cultures. That's from Collins. He wrote that too. Jesus had an awareness of differences, culture, whether it was cultural, gender, hierarchical, etc. His model of praxis, the how of his engagement, shifted as the context and company shifted, though his message remained the same. So consider his engagement with Pilate or Herod, the Pharisees, the woman in Samaria in John 4. Whether he challenged a group by writing in the sand in John 8, or shared a message through multiplying loaves and fish in John 6. Jesus practiced an eclectic, trans-theoretical, multimodal integration of psychology and theology such that the biopsychosocial, spiritual etiology of the human was fully engaged every time, though rarely the same or at the same time. So as you know from our conversation on the 15th of July, we call this the paraclesis model of praxis. Jesus, he calls it Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. That was his life. So the only difference between Jesus' example and your Christian counseling praxis is you're not Jesus. So the responsibility of the Christian counselor to know the rock upon which they stand and be intimately in tune with the Holy Spirit and knowledgeable of God's sacred text such that he or she might critically analyze models of praxis that create a balanced, decentered but influential, borrowed from narrative therapy, pointing to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, journeying alongside those who are hurting. This is profound. So having just mentioned knowledge of scripture, of which all in this particular room experience considerable professional working proficiency, please allow me to break that rule just for one second and misuse 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8 scripture. To those who are not Christian counselors, I say, it is better for you to remain that way, except 
if you cannot control yourself and you are burning with passion. Yes, this is a clear and obvious misuse of the biblical verse about marriage, which you would never do in practice, but it is a humorous way to emphasize the enormity of freedom that Christian counselors have alongside profound responsibility. One of the quotes of Viktor Frankl that I quote frequently, though I will admit to disliking immensely due to its provocative truth is this. Freedom, however, is not the last word. Freedom is only part of the story and half of the truth. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into more arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. That is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented by the Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. Viktor Frankl, 1992. We have freedom in Christ to be equipped to journey alongside God's children towards Christ likeness by the power of the Holy Spirit. How responsible do you need to be to do this? And how on earth does one journey alongside someone towards Christ likeness? So let's start with what we call a scope of practice. Scope of practice. Discern your calling and respond accordingly. If you wish to be a psychologist, please apply for a psychology degree. There are those who are not accepted for psychology degrees who come to Christian counseling degrees in the hope of being able to practice as psychologists under another name. My friends, please hear this. It is a different scope of practice, though with the same end goal of seeing broken people whole. God may be leading you to Christian counseling through the closed door of psychology, but please do not think you've walked through the door into psychology. While Christian counseling is limited to Christian counselors, it is not limited to Christian clients. Some clients will accept your help, but not the Christian message. That said, Galatians 6 verse 9 and 10 reminds us to do good to all people even though believers may receive more of your attention. Humanity experiences problems due to sin. Their own sin, sin that is transpired against them, or simply by being born into a fallen world. Sin is the problem. While there are biopsychosocial spiritual reasons for problems, our scope of practice is in knowledge of all four of those spaces, though we practice in the latter. So let me remind you where we are at the moment. So that is where we are, and this is where we're going. Let's talk about being equipped. Being equipped by SATs and the possibilities. So what does it mean to be equipped? So Christian counseling is a difficult but challenging venture. This is Colin speaking. It involves developing therapeutic personality traits, being sensitive to people, learning skills, understanding the counseling process, becoming familiar with the basics of common problems, being alert to the dangers involved in counseling, having a growing familiarity with scriptures, and being sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Every client is different, unique, with their own problems, attitudes, values, strengths, weaknesses, expectations, and experiences that are unlike any other. Each situation is a unique combination of influences from the counselee, other people, and the environment. The counsellor, whose own problems, attitudes, values, expectations, and experiences are also brought into the counselling situation, must appreciate each individual with a little, a little bit differently from each of the others. The course of counselling will also vary from person to person, and often from each session and the one that came before it. You can read about that in Collins. On top of all of what I've just said is also ethics and the law. You need to know what the law states about bringing the gospel message into a counseling session. In some countries, the gospel message is not permitted in a secular counseling session. And so the equipping that those particular Christian counselors need to receive, practicing as because they're practicing in a secular space, 
are tools and models of praxis that assist them to bring this out in more indirect ways, respecting the client and the law in their made in God's image humanity and the journey that that client is on with the Lord. So being appropriately equipped helps the counselor understand the biopsychosocial spiritual etiology, the fancy word for cause of problems, such that Christian counselors can effectively discern when to refer a client to a psychologist or psychiatrist, and when the client is safe in the care of the Christian counselor. So further to this, counselors are equipped to know when problems are of a spiritual nature, where Ephesians 6 spiritual battle is a reality. And we want to avoid the extremes of C.S. Lewis's warning. He warns us, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased with both errors. Being equipped as a Christian counselor is understanding the gift of the risen Christ, the role of the Holy Spirit and the mandates of scripture. It is grasping legal boundaries and learning ethical responses and practices, discerning good supervisors and engaging competent conversation partners. It is being able to care for oneself and not only knowing, but being self-disciplined in the spiritual practices of Christianity, such that every encounter with another human being is like walking on holy ground, as my student Haneli Swat always calls it. The, pra the paraclesis model is a model that trains those called to Christian counseling with the theory, sorry, in the theory of coming alongside a hurting, broken individual in an ethically responsible, Bible-based, Christ-centered and spirit-led, psychologically sound way, answering the questions who, what, where, and when. It also begins the process of answering the how. So how to come alongside somebody. As we all know, counseling is not preaching, nor teaching, it is counseling. So knowing all that we have said so far and agreeing with it still doesn't afford the Christian counselor the ability to practice. Hence the need for further models of praxis. Remember the movement between theory and practice to either adopt or shape or borrow from such that we are able to effectively come alongside and do no harm. So let's talk a little bit about approaches to Christian counseling. So what is the ideal? An eclectic, multimodal, trans-theoretical, integrative approach to Christian counseling. And everybody in the room who knows Christian counseling will have a little giggle at that because I pretty much said the same word in four different ways. It is not your theology, my friends. This is your praxis built on your Bible-based, Christian, uh, Christ-centered, spirit-led, theological. See, now I've said it wrong again. Let's try that one again. So this is not your theology. This is your praxis. And what is it built on? I think you could all say this even better than me by now. Bible-based, Christ-centered, spirit-led theology, acknowledging the uniqueness of each individual, respecting the value of each one towards Christ-likeness to fulfill the works designed for them before the world began. So as we know, life happens, suffering happens. Frankel speaks of the tragic triad of death, guilt, suffering, sin and psychosis, life on a fallen planet, humanity's choices, avoidable and unavoidable suffering. Humanity is in a state of alienation from God. Unbelievers are seeking. Believers can become stuck in the battle between the flesh and the spirit. How might a Christian counselor engage the person behind the problem, help the client reconnect to their true source of life, living water, the bread of life, the person of Jesus Christ? How might a Christian counselor help a client be responsible, making choices, the flesh versus the spirit choices, find and move forward in the works uniquely designed for them before the foundation of the world, and how might a client journey towards Christ-likeness? 
Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He gives the Holy Spirit to those who believe. So what does this mean for Christian counselors and the clients? So let's unpack the five points that you have in front of you. Number one, engaging the person behind the problem. What about engaging the culture behind the problem? Or perhaps this can be a part two conversation when we talk about culture and context. But what about the person behind the problem? God is always working. John 5. Though humans become alienated, blinded or stuck. A person who enters conversation with a Christian counselor is someone in which the spirit is already at work who is thirsty, hungry, and seeking. Perhaps we might consider skill sets from narrative therapy. Do you remember the symposium on the 22nd of July? As a problem is being shared, usually in story, a counselor uses the technique of double listening to hear the problem-saturated story while listening for where God is at work. The alternative story that illuminates God's work in the life of the client. So for the Christian counselor, double listening is a spirit-led skill in which the counselor comes alongside, listening for the parts of the story where he or she might engage the person behind the problem, where the human and his God are still connected. The techniques or tools of externalization, does that sound familiar? The technique or tool of externalization might be utilized to separate the person and the problem such that they might not only see the problem in light of its origins, effects, and influences, but also such that the client might be able to see where the problem is not. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3. So where the problem is not, and where the person is intact and whole, could it be that this is where the Spirit of God is? Where the value of the human in relationship with God is? If so, should not the counselor have skills in exploring the glory of God, the hope of his presence, even if it is only evident in the most minuscule part of the person's life? When lost, blind, or stuck, one might not be in a position to find, see, or respond to Jesus' invitation to life, to drink of living water, and to eat of the bread of life. Externalization that White and Morgan describe offers both the counselor and the client a picture of the flesh and the spirit in that particular client. To see the difference between flesh and spirit might be the start of being empowered to choose the one over the other. An alternative story could thus emerge. You'll remember the words alternative story based on the skill sets shared by Clifford and Nicole last week. Let's look at point number two on your screen. Help the client, individual, a group, a marriage, a congregation, whoever the client may be, to reconnect to their true source of life. Once these alternative stories or what we call sparkling moments are explored and an alternative story collaboratively imagined by the spirit, the client and the counselor, there is then an invitation to stop, listen, think and choose when life stimulus is experienced. Perhaps logotherapy, which if you remember correctly, was discussed on the 8th of July symposium with Dr. Taria and Dr. Kanda. Maybe logotherapy might offer skill sets in exploring avoidable suffering and unavoidable suffering, as these two ask different questions of the client. One is a call to responsibility, repentance and change. The other is a call for a choice of attitude towards. Both can be accomplished through the logotherapy skill of Socratic dialogue as a conviction or an invitation to that which the client has been designed for, created for, and will be fulfilled by. You can see Frankel's work in 1992 and 2011. Let's look at point number three that you have there in front of you. Being responsible, choosing to live by the spirit, not the flesh. So as the gospel shared is followed by discipleship, so too is there a learning for the client in living out their freedom in Christ responsibly. Living a virtuous life of meaning requires a consciousness that can respond. Well, I'm going to repeat that because this is actually important. 
living a virtuous life of meaning requires a conscience that can respond to life circumstances from within Christocentric values in the community of believers such that the body of Christ is healthy and thriving. Horn reminds us that a conscience led by the Spirit of God is a conscience captivated by the Word of God. The might the techniques of dereflection and paradoxical intention borrowed from logotherapy challenge clients beyond psychology's self-actualization through logotherapy's self-transcendence towards Christ-actualization? For the conscience to reconnect with the Spirit of God, a facilitation of skillful questioning and engagement, comparing spiritual things with spiritual is needed. Take a look at point number four in front of you. Find and move to walk forwards in the works uniquely designed for each one before the foundation of the world. Though our clients suffer, and in all reality, the suffering may not go away for everybody, how does one explore meaning in that suffering and calling despite that suffering? And sometimes, as Frankel says, because of that suffering, how do we help our clients suffer well, exploring God's unique design, gifting, and calling may be facilitated through Victor Frankel's logotherapy skill sets. Looking at point number five on your screen, journeying towards Christ-likeness. How might one solidify new connections and choices made into habitual lifestyle of meaning and purpose in Christ, but perhaps through celebrations therapeutic letters and remembering conversations such that the client is empowered in their relationship with Jesus by the power of the Spirit to continue in the Spirit in grace and truth. From narrative therapy, we borrow some powerful tools towards this end. So this is the journey of Christian counseling, borrowing safe, legal, ethical skill sets that speak to the need of the scope of practice that does not require a desk, two chairs, four walls, and a closed door to engage. Meeting the person behind the problem for Christian counselors is not restricted to the office. In fact, I would like to recommend that it can be removed from the office often to explore the created of God with the creator in creation as there is even more profound unfolding of the grand biblical narrative of God in relationship with humanity. When we remove ourselves from the center of the story and place ourselves in the center of his story. My friends, it's time to explore what ethical Christian counseling could look like within our scope of praxis by his power and for his glory. So let me show you the framework one more time. And while you look at that, I'm having a sip of water. You can too. All right. So now that we've explored all of these, what is possible as a Christian counselor? So let's look at what Christian counseling is as ministry in the office. Perhaps we can talk about what we learned today and take it into the office. So is this your dream office? Perhaps, perhaps the style is a little bit archaic in your mind. So then think about it. What would your dream counseling office look like? What does the chair look like? And the desk? What about where the client sits? What about where you sit? What does this particular office space communicate to the client? So these are a few things that may be important to think about when we talk about in the office counseling and the message that it is bringing that distracts both the counselor and the client from the messenger that we are hoping to engage, the person of Jesus through the Spirit. So this office gives a message to the client, and this is the message that it may be communicating. It's saying, you are the little person who has the problems, and I am the expert who has the answers to all your problems. Whether this is the message we are intending to give or not, there is power in sitting in a particular seat. What about if you're sitting where the senior pastor sits or wearing a suit that you preach in? All of this centers the counselor in the position of expert, 
the central position of the unfolding narrative in the seat that actually belongs to the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, if you remember the learning from the symposium on July 15th. Let's look at this office space. Perhaps this one is a little bit more realistic to many of us, or many pastors, especially in the room. Perhaps your counseling space is three chairs or two couches in a seat. This is not wrong. But perhaps a simple yes and might be appropriate with a question that says, what are the other options? So I invite you today to consider your God-given calling in exploring the client's story, engaging the person behind the problem as if you are walking on holy ground and listening for what God is doing in the life of the client. I would argue that there may be alternative options for Christian counselors to explore problems, solutions, responsibility, conscience, the spirit of God, choices, and God's unique design and invitation, both in the office and at the office. So I'd like to show you a few images that I have been given permission to share with you. And these are some of my colleagues that are practicing outside of the office in their practice. SATS does not teach you the tools of working out of the office. SATS teaches you tools that you can take out of the office and encourages you to continue the conversation. So why leave the office? And are we even allowed to leave the office? So the answer to the latter question is yes, we are allowed to. But why? Let me attempt that one. So Weyer, in an article written for the American Psychological Association titled Nurture by Nature, reminds us that being in nature is linked to improved attention, lower stress, better mood, reduced risk of psychiatric disorders, and very useful to the new Christian counselor, empathy and cooperation. It's lovely when your clients are ready to cooperate. Green spaces, trees, moving water, forests, fields, benches and gardens, all of this can boost your mood just by walking in nature, even in urban nature. The article continues to connect being in nature with happiness, even when you're not physically immersed in nature. The visual stimulation and natural sounds of nature have a dramatically different effect on the brain and subsequent chemistry response than that of towns and cities. The further positive influence of being outside, cognitive development, self-control is enhanced, more focused attention, remembering, cognitive flexibility, cognitive replenishment, problem solving, a sense of meaning and purpose in life, decrease in mental distress. That's all from the Weyer article 2020. Cynthia France, a professor of psychology and environmental studies in Ohio, claims, Spending time in nature has cognitive benefits, but it is also, but it also has emotional and existential benefits that go beyond just being able to solve arithmetic problems more quickly. Existential? That's our space. So encouragement to the novice counselor. The work is being done, even when you're stumbling through yours. Much work is being done simply by taking a walk with your clients. But what about counseling those who are in hospital, in school, or with those waiting for work on the corner of Main Road and Park Street? How might we envision, how might we envisage counseling conversations that draw people from within their problem saturated state of life, fallen, broken, stuck towards their calling, their design, their creator? So what are people doing in the counseling space out of the office that you may wish to learn more about? Here are a few stories from my colleagues. Classy started what he calls street school, retreats in India, Everest base camp trek, a week in Kathmandu, the Himalayan challenge, creating your own movie, all with the focus on meeting the person behind the problem using logotherapeutic skill sets. Odilia, she does counseling in a public hospital in Israel with blood cancer patients. After going through one, oh, sorry, after going through their bone marrow transportation, where clients are questioning life and existence, meaning and purpose, and asking what happens next? 
what happens if I die? Odelia takes a guitar into one session and takes a friend of the sick person to visit in the next, wheelchairing them out of the hospital, into the gardens, and into conversations. Danida. Danida takes Brady, who is her golden retriever, to a school for children with learning disabilities. They have psychologists, they have psychiatrists. She's not either one of those. She is the counsellor, or rather, I should say, perhaps, she takes in Brady, who is the counsellor. Sharon, she invites the local under-resourced community to meet the herd of horses and donkeys, exploring life skills, problem solving, and learning about the conscience. As we know, the conscience is a part of the human that differs from animals in that it can think and choose, though it's fallible, it errors, and it falls. A conscience that is awakened also awakens a sensitivity of Holy Spirit and human spirit engagement. How we long for the ability to know right and wrong, spirits from flesh, and be able to choose the next right thing in the moment that life circumstances press a response from us. In the herd of horses and donkeys, people see, hear, touch, feel, explore, and are faced with the consequences of their choices, sometimes quite instantly, I assure you. The learning is profound. So on the slide that you have in front of you, look carefully at the top right hand corner of the picture on the right above the sheep. Do you see the word honesty on the tree on the left on the right? This comes from a mindfulness journey of discovering values. This is also part of a prayer walk. So if there is time, I'll come back to this and share more about some of these activities. So how might counselling look and what is required of us to learn as we build on the foundations of Bible-based, Christ-centred and Spirit-led grace and truth? How might we learn together and work together? How might we co-labour with the Spirit of God in what He is already doing in the life of God's children? My colleague Bataya, working with puppets in Slovakia, Mark is working through dance and drama in Cape Town. What Classy calls journeys of discovery, in my private practice, I like to call continuing conversations, where the spirit of God is touching the spirit of man. So all of these other skills are added onto your foundational learning, which needs to be, are you ready for it? Bible-based, Christ-centered, spirit-led, and psychologically sound. Perhaps there might be an invitation to learn how to walk or journey alongside in unique spaces in professional, ethically sound ways within your scope of practice. Tools in your toolbox continue to be added. We never stop learning. As long as your foundation is solid and you are ethically sound and you remain within your scope of practice. Christian counseling is a calling. It's a calling to know your scriptures, to be intimate with the Spirit of God and be equipped in your gifting as an ethical counselor of excellence. As I said in the introduction, today I have the opportunity to be a spokesperson for a profound conversation between God and Sats as it unfolds in the field of Christian counseling. We do not have all the answers or options or opportunities but we are committed to continuing this conversation.